I am going to be talking to you today about IFRS, and it's going to be where we've been, uh, where we are today, and where we're going. Uh, are you guys okay if I, do I have to talk right into the mic, or am I okay back here? Rob, you're my guy. Good? Good. So, um, so with that, go through a few slides for you. Those are my questions. And today, uh, I'm going to be calling this presentation, Guys, Beverage Analysis Series. In the past, I've called it a What the Heck series. I decided to change it, and uh, you'll see why in just a couple of seconds here. So, first of all, these are my benchmarks. A workout. So, if I have a workout and I'm feeling really good about it, I might sit down with a beer, a glass of wine. Uh, similarly, on the mental uh, workout, I might enjoy a glass of beer or wine. If I have to think quite a bit about this thing and it difficult applications, well, maybe I deserve a little scotch. And the third one is, wow, when I have mental gymnastics and a workout at the same time, so I've really had to work hard to figure out what's going on and how it applies to me, I'm due for a tequila. So those are my rankings today in terms of difficulty as we go through the IFRSs. Uh, firstly, where have we been? Uh, there are really two of them. There's IFRS 9, financial instruments, and IFRS 15, which is revenues. So I'll talk first about revenues. Uh, and it's specific. It's contracts. You need a contract to have uh, meet the revenue recognition policy. Uh, it's effective last year, and it really is one model uh, for all types of revenue. And what do you do? You recognize revenue upon a transfer, and there's a key word here of control. Control of a good or a service. It's very principles-based. Lots of guidance out there. The handbook has plenty of examples, and if you go on the internet, you'll find more. One of them is going to suit your purpose if you have revenues. Application, uh, well, it's a five-step model. You need a contract, performance obligations, determine the transaction price, uh, marry up the transaction price with those obligations, and then recognize revenue as you complete those obligations. So it's quite, quite prescriptive in its own nature. Uh, and there's lots of analysis required for companies that do have revenue. Uh, there's a significant impact on telecommunications but overall, after it's all said and done, my understanding is we have about a 2% change to the financial statements as a result of adoption of this standard. So, man, I think it took four or five years for this one to come out. There's a 2% impact at the finish line. <laughs> Guys, beverage ranking? Well, it's two beers <coughs> and or, or two glasses of wine because really it was quite a read um, you could have both if you actually had revenue and had to apply it. How about IFRS 9? This is financial instruments. Effective last year. Uses a business model test for your assets. Liabilities remain the same, but assets is where we had our changes. It's classification on how you manage them. And it had a big effect on uh, long-term loans, equity investments, non-vanilla financial assets, that's like a compound receivable, a receivable that's convertible, for instance, uh, which became one asset instead of two, uh, and hedging. The side effects are, well, more disclosure, earlier receivable impairments, and more effect on the P&L. Wasn't me. Um, now you've got 2.5% classification of uh, financial assets. Call it two and a half. There's some argue it's three. So amortized cost or solely uh, 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 principal and uh, solely payments of principal and interest. That's SPPI. The other one is amortized cost for sale. Uh, that's where you could sell a receivable if you're not intending to keep it long term. And you've got the last one, fair value. The overall effect, lots more disclosure. And a new way of thinking for receivables, it's the ECL model, the expected loss, or expected credit loss model. It's a little more prescriptive, again, in terms of how you would recognize losses on receivable. Uh, we still have levels of complexity for compound uh, assets. 
that really haven't been settled yet. There's still a lot of discussion in the community. The impact, well, based on our client base, uh, the effect has really been minimal. There's lots of effort, however, in understanding this standard. Uh, the changeover we have seen has primarily been in the disclosure areas. Um, as well, I'm just going to step back, as well, you've uh, present, uh, sorry, fair value in terms of some of the investments, for instance, private company investments, <coughs> fair value can be a challenge. And so there is uh, certainly a lot of judgment and uh, an estimation included in IFRS 9. My beverage ranking, it's two beers or two glasses of wine and two scotches because you just did a lot of reading and you had to figure out how it affected your business. But most people got this pretty much right. Where we are ooh, today, IFRS 16, I said this last year in my What the Heck series, this is brought to you really by the airline industry. It's effective for years. This year, January 1, the effect is on the lessee. It is not so much the lessor, a very little change there. And here's a big one. Well, it capitalizes all but immaterial or short-term leases with some exemptions, and I'm gonna go through those exemptions. Uh, with respect to um, the short-term, the kind of the practical expedient, you need to disclose that. It's really, I think uh, the benchmarks are about 5,000 US being the immaterial value and short term being less than one year. It's one lease model for all lessees. Uh, so let's go through some of those exemptions, ones you don't have to apply the lease standard to. The first one is oil and gas, mineral properties, non-regenerative and biological assets service concession arrangements, intellectual property leases, and rights under certain arrangements. So there are some scope outs. Keep that in mind. It's the first place I would look if I'm looking in the uh, lease territory, and then I'm going to look for the term and the amount and see if I can get out of this thing. Chances are you're scoped in some way, shape, or form if you have an office lease, for instance, greater than one year. You need a contract. You need a written contract. And I'm going to tell you, this is IFRS. Usually it's in something I would tell you from an auditing perspective. Guys, document your work. But they built this one right into IFRS. At the inception of a contract, an entity shall assess. And shall in the handbook means you must. So you must assess whether the contract contains a lease or not. What does that mean? It means that you need your CFO or whoever in your office needs to go through virtually every contract in your office, summarize it, and determine if it has a lease contained within the contract. And there are surprises when you get there. So we as auditors are trying to sign off under IFRS, so I know you guys are going to help us and do that analysis before we come in and do our audits. And it is going to be a lease if the contract conveys the right to control, keyword again, control, the use of an identified asset for a period of time in exchange for consideration. Identification considerations for your leases. Is there an identified asset? If a lessor can substitute that asset, chances are you're not going to come and sit in this standard. So that's a scope out. Uh, you have a right to obtain substantially all the benefits of the asset in the lease. You have a right to direct the use of that asset. Uh, decisions about that asset are made during your period of use and it's your decision, not the lessor's. And there are certain protective rights. As for the measurement, it will sound easy and it gets more complex as you get into the details. The first thing you need is a term. You need your payments, you need a discount rate, and then you need a net present value calculation. Firstly, about that term, it's the non-cancellable period to start with. And you would add to that an extension if there's relative certainty that you are going to extend your lease. Uh, and if you've got an option to terminate, it might be the opposite. Uh, lease measurement 
the payments side. Uh, it's fixed payments and in, sub in substance or unavoidable payments. It's going to be variable payments linked to a, an index, lease incentives, you would deduct those, uh, purchase options if your exercise is expected, termination penalty if that's expected, and residual guarantees. So those things you need to take into account on that buildup of that liability called a, a, a lease liability. With respect to the discount rate, you've got an option here. And the option is either the rate implicit in the lease, which is often very difficult to determine, or alternatively, the incremental borrowing rate. We see the latter more often than the former. Um, and there's more examples out in other people's financial statements that you may, may wish to look for for guidance. Uh, sometimes we end up going to the valuation side to, to get appropriate uh, incremental borrowing rates. And now the, just the last part of this, well, it's a net present value based on the term. And you, when you record that, it becomes a right of use asset. So on day one, your liability will equal your asset. And typically it includes, that asset will include the lease liability, any lease payments before you started your lease, any initial direct cost, and any decommissioning estimates. So all of those components drive your right to use asset. Watch out for reassessments. You get to reassess if there's a change in a term, an assessment of your option, whether you're going to exercise or not, amounts payable for residual guarantees, an index rate, and the effect will be on your asset and your lease liability, potentially a p &L effect as well. Lease modifications, you remeasure. As soon as you have a modification in a lease, you are remeasuring, and you've got to determine if you have either of the first or the second. You'll account as a separate lease or not a separate lease. A separate lease would be uh, if you really you got some new assets and new liabilities in total. Uh, consideration increases by a commensurate amount. And if it's not a separate lease, you would just adjust the liability and the asset and the related amortization and accretion. As for presentation, wow, this thing affects everything. Uh, it affects your balance sheet. You've got a right to use asset and you've got a lease liability. It affects your income statement. You've got accretion. You've got amortization, potential impairment considerations, interest expense that wasn't there in the past, a statement of cash flow, add back for all that non-cash stuff, like the uh, right to use asset and the lease itself. Uh, and principal payments are, of course, a financing activity. So you've got to separate that out. And that's after that, you can go into the disclosure items. Lots of new estimates and judgments here, just a truckload. So don't underestimate the amount of work you have to do with this standard. It's, it's pretty intensive, and when it comes to audit time, we're going to see a lot more of it. Hopefully, you'll have done your homework and it, it, things are running smoothly. Uh, the nature, of course, is like this. It's just to remind you, wow, there's, there's, there's a lot to this. Uh, new disclosure requirements, and that includes, uh, you know, if you think you're getting away with everything because you scoped out uh, your, your, the lease, uh, capitalization requirements, if you have operating leases, uh, you still have to disclose what the total value of your operating leases are in a given year. So disclosure continues even for operating leases. <coughs> so ongoing, and still with, with respect to IFRS 9, watch for changes. Changes in the term, changes in estimates. Watch out for embedded leases within a contract. We have s found this on several occasions where uh, assets may have been set aside within a contract specifically for the use of the, the uh, uh, customer, if you will, the client, and uh, it constituted uh, an embedded lease within just a regular contract. Uh, separate impairment considerations. Don't forget that you have an asset here that gets measured arguably under IFRS 16 in terms of impairment tests. Uh, so you can impair your asset and still have your lease liability. 
And if you have the fortunate circumstance of having subleases, uh, you're an intermediate lessor. Uh, determine if you've got a financing lease or if you have an operating lease. If you have a financing lease, you would uh, basically deduct that value against the asset that you're currently holding on your balance sheet for the right to use asset. So a little bit of derecognition requirement there. The internal documentation you need to provide us and for your own assessment you need to substantiate that you've looked through all of your contracts and you've assessed them for leases. You need to create that list with a summary of the terms so that we can look at that. And I can tell you the judgments and estimates are considerable. And uh, there will be discussion, by, I think, by Mark uh, later today with respect to estimates because it's a big, big, big item in the fair value world. Guys, beverage ranking. This one's a little heavier. Two beers, two wine or wines, two scotches, three tequila, and if you don't like tequila, you got a beer chaser as an option. This is just a beast of a standard. You've got to go through it, and your auditor can't do it for you. You have to do it. So, hopefully, you won't have too much trouble with it. If you do, we're always on the end of a line or the end of a bottle of scotch. Where are we now? Well, there's some narrow scope amendments coming through, effective January 1, 2019, and I'll go through these quickly. A little bit on financial instruments on negative compensation, joint arrangements where there is no remeasurement. Uh, IS-12, a bit on income taxes. The one I would comment on, uh, well, borrowing costs, maybe if it's a, a related asset, it's ready to use. It's just considered general borrowing. IS-28. Uh, the one I want to talk about just very briefly may have an impact with you and primarily I would think if you have uh, taxable income, if you're fortunate enough to have that, uh, if an entity chooses a tax treatment that is probable not to be accepted by a tax agency, then you need to <coughs> affect it as though it was fully taxable within your tax calculations, your tax accounting. And detection risk or the risk of CRA or in the US, the IFRS, coming and actually finding that, you don't even take it into account. You just assume you're caught. Beverage analysis, one glass of beer, one wine, because I think most of you, it's just going to be a quick read. Where are we going? Here's one. We have no new IFRSs this year. That is worth a beer. <laughs> Several beers, yeah, probably. Probably. Um, but having said that, you know, gee, after I think one of the, I think the IFRS uh, 9 standard or 16, one of, one of the two took about, um, I think about eight years to come through the whole process. So it's quite a long time. Uh, and these were big implementations when you think IFRS 9, 15, and 16 that I've just gone over today. They're, they were huge. So now there's all this pent up, gee, what am I going to do now stuff going on? Well, because now we've got revisions coming at us for standards. And I'm going to hit two of them in particular because I think you do need to know these. One is IFRS 3, the definition of a business. This is in an acquisition of a business. And IS 1 and 8 with respect to presentation of financial statements and accounting policy changes. And I'll start with IFRS 3, business combinations. Starts January 1 of next year. It's a new approach on the definition of a business. The end result here is going to be that fewer acquisitions are going to meet the test of a business and you will have an asset acquisition or a group of assets as opposed to a business. The effect of that is it will reduce some of the complexities involved, valuations uh, and things like intangibles on your balance sheet. So this is kind of a, kind of a good standard coming at us. Uh, change in the valuation process to include inputs, uh, employees, and here's a, a, a kind of a critical term for it. You need an organized workforce. So does that exist or does that not? You might be scoped out pretty quickly. Uh, and of course materials. And are the processes substantive? Together they contribute significantly to create outputs. Uh, no longer consider if whether the participants uh, pardon me, market participants can make this thing turn into outputs or if there are cost savings. Those are no longer considerations. There is, however, an optional concentration test. 
I'm not going to go through it other than to say you can get scoped out into IAS 8 or 16 and avoid this. Where are we going? This, this is the other one, IFRS, or pardon me, IS 1. Definition of material will now be uh, applied to financial statement disclosure starting in 2020. Uh, and it they're, they're really looking at it this way. It's information is material if omitting, misstating, or obscuring it could reasonably be expected to influence the decision makers. Um, and that's, that's new. So materiality, there's, there's now going to be a little bit of a, a, I mean, that's usually an auditor's term. Now it's going to be a financial statement disclosure term. What it really means, remove the obscure and remove the confusing disclosure. Some of that old stuff that just doesn't matter anymore, start pulling that out because the readers really do not care about that anymore. Guys, beverage ranking, well, it's really not that thick on this one, one beer one glass of wine. Where are we going? Exposure drafts. There are a number of proposed amendments. Remember I said they kind of had a little vacation after this eight-year workout of the IFRSs? So I, I'm not really going to go through too many of these other than to let you know there's a lot in the hopper. Accounting policies and estimates, insurance contracts, availability of a refund, disclosure, of accounting policies, deferred income tax, interest rate benchmark reform, onerous contracts, proceeds before intended use, and others. There's got to be a dozen out there. They're just waiting for us to absorb this in our financial statements. I hear a sigh out there somewhere. Uh, where are we going in terms of research projects? This is, gets a little further. There's going to be, uh, they're going to revisit extractive industries. What portions of it, I'm unsure. Um, but I think they'll be looking more toward, uh, I, I would expect, operational stuff. I'm not convinced they're going to come up back with any, uh, any more uh, guidance on development stage. But we'll, we'll see if that happens or not. That's one area where things are a little thin in IFRS. Uh, goodwill and impairment. I understand goodwill may become amortized as opposed to just an impairment test annually. And a little more guidance on that impairment. Uh, provisions coming at you, which is always big in terms of the estimation world. Business combinations under common control, whether you have a bump or not uh, in terms of value. Wow, there's a term, dynamic risk management. I had to look it up. It really means hedges. Financial instruments with characteristics, characteristics of equity, that is IFRS 9. And IBOR reform replaces LIBOR. Apparently the banks took a little too much uh, money out of the LIBOR fiasco. I think there was a little bit of manipulation out there. So LIBOR is effectively disappearing. And of course, others. Guys, beverage ranking for this. Guys, there's a ton of reading here. Exposure drafts are like 150 pages in some case, and you have uh, the, the new research. I'm giving you a bottle of whatever you choose. <laughs> uh, honorable mention to a couple of uh, industries that continue to provide us with continuous entertainment. Cannabis industry, biological assets under IS-41. That means you've got a fair value measurement requirement. You've got revenue recognition under IFRS 15. We went through that today a little bit. Uh, differing applications are still out there, and, 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 and that includes, and, and I think it's primarily with the, what people deem to be cost of sales and whether some of that fair value gets put into cost of sales, just how transparent that is. Uh, remember that, hey, October 17th of this year, edibles are now legal. And cross-border considerations, while state in the United States, while uh, marijuana may be uh, legal in certain states, it is still not so federally. So please do not take your pot or edibles across the border. <laughs> Who's working on this stuff? Uh, CPA Canada Cannabis Work Group. Uh, Arez is a member of that group. Uh, and the IFRS discussion group, the IDG, uh, there's others would be, you know, uh, other firms out there that are putting out specific guidance, uh, but these are two, two main work groups that I would look to. 
Uh, and now to move on to honorable mention for cryptocurrency. That one really does deserve honorable mention. Uh, they've determined, I, I think IFRIT came out and said, hey, uh, I think we told you last year, uh, but it's now been confirmed, it's really not an asset or an investment, pardon me, under IFRS 9. It's a commodity. Uh, and it's either going to be an intangible asset under IS 38, or it's going to be inventory under IAS 2. We tend to lean toward IAS 2, which means you're either going to account for this thing at cost, or you're going to account for it at fair value if you meet the test of being a, um, uh, sorry, a, a broker trader. Uh, and there's certain criteria you have to meet to be a broker trader. So that's the time you would record fair value, less cost to sell. Otherwise, pretty much at cost. And uh, revenue recognition issues under IFRS 15, um, because, gee, there may or may not be a contract. There's a little bit of guidance out there from IDG that I've seen, which I find highly useful. Uh, requires lots of consideration if you're a client in the cryptocurrency currency industry and a ton of position papers. Uh, groups working on this thing, CPA Canada Cryptocurrency Work Group, I am on that work group, uh, and uh, the IDG, as mentioned <coughs> earlier. Uh, interesting note, IFRIC has come out with a tentative agenda decision that they are no longer going to provide any further guidance. Canada, however, the ACSB has provided comments saying, would you please provide some more comments? So we'll see what comes out of that. Guys, beverage ranking, well, guess what? In the cannabis industry, do beverages apply at all? And in the cryptocurrency industry, I can only tell you, you have a hangover warning right away. Um, <laughs> it is complex from both an accounting perspective, and once we get into the auditing of a company, it is even tougher. Uh, I've not seen any two companies that are alike, so it's, it's, uh, it's uh, very engaging from a partner perspective. Good sources of information for you guys in the future, or today, or yesterday. The ISB, International Accounting Standards Board, IFRIC, uh, International Financial Reporting Interpretations Committee, the IFRS Discussion Group, IDG. IDG doesn't so much come out with um, conclusions, but they do uh, take different sides and discuss those different sides, and usually you can read between the lines as to what they think is the correct approach, but it takes a bit of a read and some interpretation, but worth going there. Uh, communications from regulators, such as the Canadian uh, Securities Administrators, the CSA, uh, viewpoints from CPA Canada. So those are all areas or, or places where I go to gain more insight into application of IFRS. Recap for this presentation, keep in mind the changes that have come across from IFRS 9 and 15. They're not a one-time event. We continue to apply them continuously. Know the impact of IFRS 15 and the, imp and, and the implementation of it. There's no new IFRSs today, but there's going to be in the future. There's lots in that hopper. And with respect to Guy's beverage analysis, please do not drink and drive. Thank you.